So hello, this is Chris Grimes, ahead of getting cracking with today's very exciting episode of The Good Listening To Show, Stories of Distinction and Genius. I just wanted to tell you about a comedy improvisation uh, workshop that I'm doing in southwest France in May. When I'm not being host and curator of The Good Listening To Show, um, I also run a comedy improvisation company, which is Bristol-based in the UK, which is called instantwit.co.uk. But on... Uh, the 17th to the 21st of May this year, we're doing something called Instant Wit Laughter Lab 4. The, you do the math. It's the fourth time we've done this. And it's at a glorious place in southwest France, surrounded on three sides by sunflowers at lesurenglais.com. www. And the French translation of the English sisters, lesurenglais.com. That's May 17th to the 21st this year. And it's surrounded on three sides, as I mentioned today, mentioned the sunflowers. And we play in the most glorious theatre studio called L'Espace. And then the English sisters of the name of the venue become private chefs to us as we play and explore the wonderfully life-affirming and liberating mindset of yes and. Yes and, yes and, yes and. The very building blocks of creativity. So you get to laugh, find true spontaneity and find your funny in the sunshine of southwest france so if you'd like to get in touch with me chris at secondcurve.uk if you want to email me about it or to find out any more also there is a dedicated facebook group to the good listening to show on facebook obviously called the good listening to group and i'm posting about that uh, the workshop continually there too anyway enjoy today's episode don't forget lesseuranglais.com 17th to 21st of may with travel either side enjoy today's show thank you Welcome to another episode of The Good Listening To Show, your life and times with me, Chris Grimes, the storytelling show that features The Clearing, where all good questions come to get asked and all good stories come to be told, and where all my guests have two things in common. They're all creative individuals and all with an interesting story to tell. There are some lovely storytelling metaphors, a clearing, a tree, a juicy storytelling exercise called 54321, some alchemy, some gold, a cheeky bit of Shakespeare and a cake. So it's all to play for. So yes, welcome to the Good Listening To Show, your life and times with me, Chris Grimes. Are you sitting comfortably? Then we shall begin. Ladies and gentlemen and people on the internet, on YouTube and Facebook, welcome to a glorious inception point where the good listening to show stories of distinction and and genius gets on the open road of becoming a live theatre show. Yeehaw! And here we find ourselves on the 3rd of February, uh, 2023, at the Egg Theatre in Bath. It's just non-stop opportunities to just go... Happy, which is great. And talking of stories of distinction and genius, it is my immense and great pleasure to welcome a dear friend of mine to the stage. Would you please welcome the pantomime legend and all-round glorious fixture of Bath. He's almost Lord Bath, or he should be. (laughs) Would you please welcome the glorious, the gorgeous, Mr John Money. Am I coming in? Yes. Oh, yes. We're coming in. Yes. Let's do that. We, oh. we agreed no tongues and bless you. I've just been sat there listening to people honk your horn. It's been fascinating. <laughs> Mr. John Mooney. Yes. Hello, everyone. Very good. Very good. So, John, yes. uh, take a seat. Welcome. We've got... Oh, Ooh, did you hear that? Squeaky. Yeah, that was funny. Yeah. Um, we've got... You can have a go on the park if you want. If we go down any rabbit I've, holes... I've parked it many times before, but I can't resist the opportunity for a quick... <laughs> ah, yes. marvellous. John and I are in instant wit together. We've been on stage for many, many, many years. Um, and how, do you remember, because I can't remember, you do the math, when did you join instant wit, please? Oh, I think I'm, I'm probably about ten years, something like I that. I reckon that too. Probably a decade or so. But, I mean, but we don't do, you know... We're not, uh, we don't perform together that often, do we? It's not like every weekend, but we, we, we regularly see each other through the year. But but I have been round your house for dinner as well. Have you? Yes, you invite, <laughs> Dean and you invited me round, I remember. I came with, with Leah Fletcher and we'd been to France together. And you no, that wasn't me. my house, that was Leah's house. Ah, well, thank you. I'm going to say, you're not coming here. <laughs> <laughs> no one comes to my house. Yeah, yeah, no <laughs> one's coming to my house. In my house. 
Lovely. I well, vaguely let my husband in, but, uh, but it's well, so. certainly not you. OK, well, I've seen you walk your dog Hamish near your house. <laughs> yes, yeah. Maybe I was just loitering in the garden or stalking me. Yeah. Yes, lovely. I'm not stalking you, but welcome. Thank you. No, lovely. not at all. Pleasure so, um, I know you know who you are, but John Money, ladies and gentlemen, is the most glorious and delicious fixture here at the Bath Theatre Royal. I came, used to go and see John at the, bar, at the Bristol Old Vic when he was being in the pantomimes with Chris Harris. I never did that. Well, you... <laughs> Chris Harris mentored you is where I'm yes, going. Yes, yes, but I never did the Bristol Old Vic. Is that because you were too if good listening, that? I'd like to. Yes. Um, no, I'm very happy here. <laughs> <laughs> so where did you, let's go there. Where, how did you meet Chris Harris, first of all? Well, I, I met him purely because I, the, the, I, was, I was a presenter on HTV for quite some time, and yeah. I was aware that often a, a local TV face did pantomime. And I thought, well, I, I studied drama, and that's, that was sort of a love of mine. So I, I just simply wrote to the theatre. And, and, and sort of proffered myself, uh, threw myself at their feet, and, and they spoke to the producers, and they said, oh, go on, then we'll give them a little part. So I did, I did my first one in 1996, I think it was, and that was Cinderella and I was Dandini. And, um, and then the next time I did it, uh, new producers had taken over, but they'd seen me in that, and they got me back. And that was the start of Chris Harris's uh, long tenure. tenure here at Bath because it's a, a, a Bath kind of poached him from the old Vic in Bristol. Ah, so you didn't write to him at the Bristol. No, no, Vic. no. You we we, we simply context. met in rehearsals. Yes, and it was his. It was his sort of. Fir- it was the first one of his long reign at Bath. He'd done Bath before in the eighties, but just sort of yes. as, he, as he moved around the country, then he became synonymous with Bristol and wrote yes. and directed in Bristol. And then something happened with him in the Bristol old Vic, and I was never too sure quite what what happened. But they yes. went their separate ways, and Bath grabbed him, and then we met on uh, Aladdin, strangely. Uh, and, and for some reason, he saw something in me that he liked, and, and, and he used to ask for me back each year, because then he took over directing. Um, and, and sort of we then became uh, a kind of a double act, I suppose. And I think I did about 13 with him, I think. Yes, yeah. and you had a, the most wonderful relationship with him. And I oh, he was fabulous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Extraordinary man. And he was a classic old vaudevillian. Now, I think of him as being sort of the modern equivalent. I know he's no longer with us, but he was a bit of a, a Stan Laurel vaudevillian, but for now. Until yeah, he's no, no he, knew, he, knew, he knew everything, every trick in the book. Uh, I mean, you always felt so safe with him on stage. Yeah. Because obviously with pantomime, it's, it's not a, 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 a fixed rigorous structure you can stretch it a little bit and things happen and you can improvise a, a bit not too much we try not to do that otherwise people never get to go home um and uh, but, but well, whatever happened you knew that if you were on stage alongside chris then he, he as i say every trick in the book up his sleeve he could get out of any situation and, and you uh, said that you used the word you said bizarrely we met on aladdin you've just full history so yeah just, just aladdin. yeah that was my fourth fourth aladdin yeah yeah and you were, you were wishy-washy, so we're here to talk about... But I've got a slide for you, dear. Woo! There, there he is. Yay. We knew you who are. And uh, it says on your website, by the way, you're a highly experienced and award-winning actor and writer, <laughs> a regular improviser, and you're an occasional table. Yes. Yeah, it's, it, it was just a joke. You know, I, I, like, I like, you know, there is such a thing as an occasional table, so yes. I thought I'd, I'd, I'd... I was just trying to fill in some space on, in the box when I was making my website. It's, I'm not really... It's, no, but it makes you think of Gilbert and George, if you're willing to be an occasional well, table. Well, that's, that's very kind of you. Yeah, yes. I'll, I'll go with that. And I, yes, and you don't have to be naked whilst you're being the table. I, I won't be. Quite right. <laughs> that, was in, that was in your ride. I wanted yeah, you to go naked this evening. He won't he be won't naked. He won't go naked. That's nice. <laughs> so you are a, now a legend of the Bath Theatre Royal Panto. They, they've asked you to direct it, but you decided not to do that. Yes, they've asked. Yeah, I have been asked a, a few times. Yeah, I, yeah. Yeah, well, I just kind of think if you're in it and you've written it and you direct it, it's a bit much. It's greedy. Because and, 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 if it's awful, I mean, yeah. there is no one else to blame. Yes. I mean, and and I, I like, I, I love the rehearsal process. I love the, the we, we, we only get 10 days to put the whole show together. So it's quite an um, intense, uh, short period of time to rehearse. <laughs> it's not a lot. Um, and I like to leave as soon as I can if I'm allowed to leave early. Whereas if you're the director, you've got to turn up first, you leave last. Pretend you care. You pretend you care. <laughs> um, and, and, and you've got to take responsibility and you've got to be a people person. And I don't really like people that much. <laughs> well, not people. I mean, it's, 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 you've got to, you know, liaise with, you've got to deal with the children and the chaperones and, yeah. the, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a lot of smiling. <laughs> you don't want to be doing that. Don't no, want to be doing that, I, no. I've got to save them up. We thought you were the people's person's people person. Well, but, I don't mind them. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you won't let them in your house, though. We established no, that. No, I won't let you in my house. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying. Yeah. So, yes, we're, it's going to be my absolute joy. By the way, I've just been... I came to see you. I, I managed to blag a free ticket. I got you that ticket. You did get yeah. me that ticket. Um, and you have... You've got eyes of glory, if I may say so. You've got the most <laughs> expressive eyes in the business. Yeah, so, I guess there's a point when I looked in the mirror and I thought, yeah, that's why I've ended up in Panto. You suddenly realise you're not going to play James Bond. Do you know what I mean? You, you, well, you, there's a point when you think, oh, this, this isn't going to happen. This is a face for Panta. You could be the name's Googly Eyes, Googly Eyed Bond, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> You're just going to sit there and insult me all night. No, 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 yes, yeah, no, so, I, yes, I know what you mean. But then you use it. If you've got a, a, a rubbery face, as indeed You do I have, have a rubbery face. A rubbery face and, and uh, you know, sort of boggly eyes that, that can jiggle. Then, um, you know, I mean, some people can tap dance. Uh, others can juggle, but I can... Jiggle my eyes. You can so. also jiggle your nether wallops on a keyboard as well. That was one of the more unusual aspects of the pantomime, where you did this brilliant vaudevillian, I experienced it as being routine, where you and Nick Wilton were standing behind a piano. Yes. And you were clanging out some... What was the tune you were clanging? Uh, oh, gosh. It, it's, the, it's the music they use in Big when Tom Hanks is playing on the piano. Dun, 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 dun which I think is called Heart and Soul. Yeah. So, yeah, I chose that piece of music. That seemed to work. Um, yes, well, we're sort of uh, pretending to have dropped our trousers and we, we, we raise our hands in the air and bob up and down and, and bang out a tune. <laughs> As you do. So you've got, if I may, you've got googly eyes <laughs> and, and quite heavy bollocks, is sort of what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, it's a, it's, it's a CV, isn't Would it? Would you like to do the bell? <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> There we go. Yes, googly bollocks. <laughs> we will move on. Now, um, I was told not to do that because the microphone. UK Health Radio. The station that makes you feel good. UK Health Radio. The station that makes you feel good. Now, it's going to be my absolute pleasure, John, to curate you through the structure of the Good Listening To show. Okay. A, a story of distinction and genius, you fit right in. You're very, very distinctive, not just because of your heavy bollocks in your eyes, but you're also a genius as well. well yeah, a okay, genius. well, that's a, uh, I think you've gone too far, but that's very kind. Bless you. You accepted the first part of that. <laughs> yes, right. not I can't deny that. Yes, I do have heavy bollocks. Now, that, that, we're going to move on. So, it's going to be a clearing... And you've been kind enough to prepare, although I don't know what your answers are, which is the really exciting thing. Yes. So I'm going to ask you, what is, where is a clearing like for you in a moment? And that's at your serious, happy place of choice. Then you've been kind enough, if you look at the tree, it's all there. You've, you've thought about your responses to a structure, which is called 54321, where you've had five minutes, or as long as you've needed since I told you you were going to do this. Thank you for saying yes. Sorry, I asked you if you'd be willing to do this. And then you're going to answer four things that have shaped you. Right. Three things that inspire you. Yes. Two things that never fail to grab your attention. And don't do the squirrels yet, by the way. This is just a demo. Uh, there's going to be a, a random squirrel that comes in. Those are the monsters of distraction. Oh, squirrels. We'll do that in a minute. And then a quirky or unusual fact about you, uh, John Money, we couldn't possibly know until you tell us. OK. So, then there'll be some alchemy, some gold, a couple of random squirrels, as mentioned, a cheeky bit of Shakespeare, and a cake. Wow. It's all to play for. All in an hour. All in an hour. Watch this space. You'll so, be lucky. <laughs> let's get you on the open road. If at any point you feel you'd like a drink, I've got some branded tumblers. OK. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you for the, for the water. These are new from Ikea as well. <laughs> you, you've gone mad, Chris. It's the good listening to shop. It isn't really. I just made that up. Anyway, so let's get you on the open road then of this structure. Um, John Money, pantomime, legend, legend. Where is, what is, a clearing like for you? Where do you go to get clutter-free, inspirational and able to think? I think my favourite place, I, I presume it has to be a favourite place, of, of pure relaxation. I'm, I'm gonna, can I put myself on a lilo? I would like to be on a lilo in a swimming pool. Not in the sea, that's, that's too dangerous uh, and too salty. Uh, so in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a pool. On a lilo, in a pool, headphones on, that's my, you know, that's utopia. Private pool. I don't want anyone else in there. Yes. So it's just, it's just a lilo and a pool. There's something about just drifting and bobbing gently. Drifting <laughs> and bobbing along on yeah. a private pool lilo with John. What colour is it, please, John? Uh, well, I, I'll go blue. It's my favourite colour. 
And by the way, I hope you're going to talk about this. There was a summer holiday of glee where you just randomly kept, kept, kept uploading all the various inflatable gizmos that you were actually stealing from children. I do love a lilo. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I, I went on holiday uh, with my husband and, and uh, there, was a, there was a fantastic lilo, which wasn't mine or, or ours. I think it was like a, a whale. It was almost life-size. It was enormous. And I thought, <laughs> I need to have a, get a photograph on that. So when, I, when the family left it, I, I, I got on it. And, and took a photograph on it. And then it became a game to see how many f- different lilos I could get a photograph of myself on. To the point where I was, I was following people around the resort. Um, and, <laughs> and I would put them on Facebook. So I think I had a whale and a shark, and there was a chameleon, and there was a dog. The dog, was, the dog was difficult to get. I had to, to bargain with a, with a Japanese family. Who did, <laughs> they didn't really understand why I wanted their five-year-old's dog, Lilo, but we yeah. got it. Um, and, uh, I, I would, and then people were helping out. You, you, people would say, have you seen? There's a slice of pizza uh, in the other pool. Oh. And I'd be like, no, 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 I'm not doing foodstuffs. I'm only doing animals. Um, You're really boundaried. I like you. You won't let me in your house. <laughs> oh, no, I have, I have a strict rules. Yeah. And there was, but there was one which was basically a child's inflatable ring, but it had, a, I think it was a giraffe's head. And I waited and waited <laughs> until the family had gone to the, to the running finger buffet. And then I, and then I grabbed it. I thought, great, now's the time. And, I, and I, I just about got into it. But by God, getting out of it was difficult oh, before, my God, before the family yes. came back. Um, but people found it amusing. I, I enjoyed myself. I very much enjoyed your summer holiday vicariously because of that. <laughs> in fact, you then subsequently told me a story um, whereby you'd got dressed to leave the holiday yeah. and suddenly you were tempted by a unicorn. We were, you know that when you're, when you're leaving the holiday and you're heading to reception and you're, you're dragging your suitcase <laughs> across the, sort of the cobbles and there was a lob, an inflatable lobster. Oh, oh it was good. I mean, it had pincers and, and, I, and I was trying to calculate, can I strip off, get in, get on the lobster, get out, get dry and still make the flight? And um, I was told that I couldn't. So I, 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 I had to leave the lobster behind. But I'll return one day. So you were told that you wouldn't, and presumably that means Dean wears the trousers, yes. really. Well, well, we both think we're men. Um, but, um, <laughs> and, but, but yes, but he was, he's, Dean is very risk averse. Uh, I mean, he, you know, he, he'd use the indicators on the bumpers, if he, if he, on the dodgems, if he had the chance. He doesn't like taking risks. So we have to be at the, at the airport you know, nine days before the flight leaves. <laughs> Quite right, too. <laughs> so there was no possibility of me um, uh, leaping on a... spontaneous leap onto an inflatable lobster, sadly. Lovely. And no, no tears from the children when you sort of nicked their inflatable? Um, well, they, they might have been crying, but they were in a swimming pool. It was hard to tell. So they were, they were there. <laughs> I like that answer. Yeah. Very good. So to come back then, we're on a clearing, floating in a private pool on your lilo. You're not worried about the colour, but it's, it's definitely got to be yours in a private pool. So your yeah, earphones yeah. on. Your headphones on, music playing, just gently bobbing, possibly a drink and nearby. Can we ask you for the music of choice as well? I know you're a big Phil Collins fan. Well, no, I'm a, I'm a big Genesis fan. Don't mind, Phil. It's, 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 it's really Genesis. So it would be 70s Genesis, not, not the more popular stuff. I'll be listening to a 12-minute Mellotron solo with different time signatures. It'll be, yeah, something really about goblins and elves. It's, it's, it's not particularly Trick mainstream. of the Tail, I'm thinking. Trick of the Tail, 1977? <coughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, one of the best, yeah. Yes, that, that's what I'll be listening to. I'm going to interrupt your reverie now, lovely, on your Lilo by arriving with a tree now. And I'm going to shake your tree uh, to find out how your um, storyteller... Te- these are storytelling apples. OK. How do you like these apples? Love them. Would you like an apple? Um, so we're going to crunch on your storytelling apples. Gonna, don't eat it, it's a prop. Oh. Okay. <laughs> oh. There is a third one, but comedy rule of three, I've got three apples. <laughs> yes, how do you like well, these apples? Thank you very much. So I'll put that there in the middle. So the metaphor is we're going to crunch along... <laughs> I haven't smelt them myself. <laughs> well, you nothing, must. Nothing to report. Um, <laughs> so, yes, this is now the storytelling apples of the five minutes to have thought about. Four things that have shaped you, three things that inspire you, two things that never fail to grab your attention, and then a quirky or unusual fact about you. So over to okay. you to crunch along on your apples. Four things that have shaped you, John. Oh, God. Well, four things that have shaped me. I, I struggled to think of, of four, but I, well, I'm, I'm going to have to go with parents, obviously. I yep. presume everybody says that. That would be odd, would it not, if people don't? Uh, a lot do, but in different ways and for different reasons. Well, I think you've got to, because, I mean, you are a, a product of your upbringing. There's always that sort of nature-nurture argument. But yes, I can see bits of my dad and my mother in me. My, God, my, my sort of dad's wit, I suppose, and my mother's anxiety. Um, so that's the... Perfect combination. <laughs> that's the combination, <laughs> which therefore tries to make you into a, some sort of comic or comic actor, I suppose. So, yeah, they, they've, they've certainly uh, shaped me, you know, lovely people that they are. Um, uh, so that's one. Mm-hmm. Have I done them now? 
Can I yes. move on? Right, right, fab. Um, uh, they're still with us. Um, they are still with us. My yeah. mum, yeah, my mum sadly has, uh, has dementia. So, um, uh, uh, in fact, I was sitting with her this afternoon because Dad had to go and do some things, so I had to go and uh, go and sit with her, which was nice because um, um, but it's, it's difficult because but uh, she's a. Uh, yeah, it's 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 tough. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I spent a couple of hours with her, a couple of games of Connect Four uh, with her this afternoon, and uh, I don't let her win. And was it about two years ago when they went a bit feral at a time that was quite strange for you because they went in a big Winnie Bago and went very 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 yeah, far well, they, away? Yeah, they retired and, and they and they had like a, a motorhome, and 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 we knew that Mum was was sort of her condition was deteriorating. Uh, and, and then they thought they would do one final trip, and they go. Dad would drive all the way down through France and down through Spain to the to the to the south of Spain, and and then stay there for two or three weeks, and then drive all the way back. But they'd be gone for sort of ten weeks or something. But it just terrified my sister and I that that if something were to go wrong, yes, that we couldn't get to them quickly uh, or get them back. Uh, and yes, and I think Dad fell ill that uh, on that occasion and and had to go into hospital. And then Mum can't remember who he is or where they are. Or, and yeah, so there there was a an anxious week or two where, the, where we couldn't get a response or, a, or an answer from them. Very commendable. Your dad did sort of the metaphorical one last hurrah. Yeah, well, he, and he, well, they went on holiday again this year. I couldn't believe it. They, they, not with the motorhome. They've given up on that now, but they decided they'd go... To, actually, no, it was just last year, just before end of last year, they decided to go to uh, Italy for a week. And again, we were very unsure about that, but I drove them to the airport. And it rained the entire week. They never left the hotel room. So, um, so I felt very sorry for them. But uh, no, bless him. He's, he's, he's doing his absolute best, yeah. So, shape it to number one is parents. Yep. Number two, please. Uh, this is where we go. <coughs> cashier number two. Please. Number two would be well. I suppose. I suppose um, amateur dramatics. Or I was quite a. Uh, I was quite an unhappy teenager. Not a child, but as a teenager, I was quite um, anxious. And I think. And, and I think there was. A, and then at school, I discovered plays and drama. And, and joined a, an amateur dramatic group here in Bath called Musical Youth, which doesn't uh, doesn't exist anymore. Um, but I'm still friends with you know with people from that time, and and that opened up a whole new world to me. And I and I and I don't know where I'd be without that introduction and without that encouragement from 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 a chap called Greg who who ran the group, and then I had a teacher called Sue Curtis at, at school because uh, we know we didn't have any um, uh, drama lessons at school. There was no drama. A level, O level, GCSE. There is now, but at the time, you just there was just one school play a year, and, and, yeah. that, and that was it. Um, and you weren't encouraged to do drama. If uh, you know, you couldn't do the school play at the same time as your exams because yeah. it, it took away from your revision. But you could be in the rugby team and, and you know, and, and, and practice rugby three times a week, and that didn't affect your studies at all. So the, yeah, the, the school I went to, uh, King Edward School in Bath, um, and they, they sort of churned out doctors and rugby players and solicitors with a plomb and I remember I remember saying well I'd like to be an actor and they, they just they just looked at me I mean they just they had no idea what to say to that or, or what advice or guidance to offer and I've been back since uh, and they've now got the most glorious um, drama facilities and, and studios and and have got a, a good name for, for the arts so things have changed but at the time yeah. it was very much you want to do what? Um, but have, finding a safe space with, with similar-minded people was certainly a, a very helpful thing. So, so Amdram and, and a couple of those names that I've mentioned there would be have also shaped me. And are they still with us? The influencers that, that yes, no, 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 Sue, my my, my old uh, English teacher. I, I spoke to her the other week. I still see her uh, pretty regularly. Uh, and Greg, who ran the theatre group in Bath, he's uh, he's pretty poorly now, but he's still around. I'll be catching up with him soon. Um, uh, yes, but 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 the importance of finding a group of like-minded individuals who mm. share that same passion is uh, when you are a little bit lost and yes. you haven't quite worked out who you are or what you are or where you want to go or what you want to do. Was, so was, it formed a safe haven at a very in, informative Yeah, it, it, it became another family, really, you know, because that, when you're sort of 16, 17, you don't want to hang out with your family, mm. but, but to find another family... Um, that, you that had understood. some sort of connection to Andrew Lincoln as a region in the region. Don't you? Yeah, well, was Andy, that? Andy was in the group. Andy was in Musical Youth. Um, uh, Andrew uh, Clutterbuck, as, as is his uh, real name, and uh, so yeah, he's a couple of years younger than me. He was once my understudy uh, in, in one of the plays, and, and uh, you know well, now he's yeah. leading Hollywood superstar kind of thing. Um, uh, but no, but we still, yeah, I spoke to him not that long ago, or texted him. We, we were chatting about something just before Christmas. So, uh, uh, and he now lives in Wiltshire, so he's back in back in the country, not too far away. 
And musical youth was, of course, something... There's another connection to that with the, the band. And there was some joke about looking forward to a second single from musical youth. because Yeah, happened. there was a band, wasn't it, in the 80s, but past yeah. the Duchy. And, and, and uh, uh, yes, I don't know why. They, we were, they were called musical youth because they put on musicals as well as plays. But, yeah. uh, but um, I'm not particularly musical. I would always... And is that still yeah. going? Is, is no, they don't. They don't exist anymore. Yeah, yeah. but the but the Bath Amdram scene has has exploded in, over the years. There used to be there, there were two groups, they're like rivals, like, uh, okay. the, like the Jets and the Sharks. <laughs> you know, um, but now there's um, and you are you are either in one group or the other. Yeah, and now people seem to to move from one group quite fluidly from. I'd do a show with them, and then I'd do, go do a show with that group. But, uh, but at the time, there were there were turf wars. <laughs> I grew up in South Ends. It's like the mods and the skinheads. Yeah. You'd always have a run yeah, yeah, yeah. on, on yeah, you know, turf rehearsal with a, with a flick knife. Yeah. All of that. Wonderful. Third shapeage, please. <laughs> oh, um, uh, well, that, surely that counts for a couple. You can have a couple. That's yeah. fine. <laughs> so you're, you're saying you'd like to move on, aren't you? From that well, now? no, I don't. I, I struggle to think of, of, of uh, which. Did, and does that sound weird? Um, I, I, I had a. I'm, I'll, I'll go. Well, okay, I'll go with. I saw a therapist for a while, which I know sounds odd, but but I, I, I yeah, I, I've had a few battles with mental health over the years. So <laughs> snooze, I know. But but there, were, there there was a there was a therapist that I saw for quite some time, and they, yeah, they they were pretty important. Yes. Yeah. So they've they've shaped me, I guess. And you um, mentioned when you first described your mum and dad, you got your sense of humour. From your ma- your dad, and then a slight anxiety from your mum. So yes. there's that sort of. Then you move into the world of theatre. Yeah, well, no, this. I, well, I know. I will. T- if it's a storytelling thing, and, and and well, I think you know this story, but I think it's a good story, and because I, I, I remember mentioning it to you. But the very first time I went to see this uh, lady, I did. I didn't want to go. I was not a happy bunny, and I. I, I can't have been made to go. I, it's difficult to remember, but I, I was certainly there, not particularly voluntarily, uh, and I sat there for this introductory session and I was very monosyllabic and I was feeling very low and I remember at the end of the session she said um so have you got any questions you'd like to ask me and I said yeah how does a carburetor work <laughs> and I don't know why I said it I don't I mean I don't know I mean I was just being obtuse and and awkward I suppose and uh, and she sort of smiled benignly and said um well I'll see you next week and I sort of got up and left uh and sure enough, I went back the following week and I sat down and the very first thing she said was, OK, so a carburetor evenly mixes the air and the water and displaces it over the surface. And she gave me a dictionary definition of what a carburetor does. And, uh, and I thought, I like you. Um, she truly listened, yes. She, it, it sort of... Because uh, if, you, if you're ever having to see or if you ever do see a therapist or, or some sort of counsellor or whatever, it's so important to have a connection with them. You know, if yes. you don't like them or you don't... Um, you know, then the, the shutters come down and the wall goes up and, and yes. you're not going to tell them anything. But from that moment on, I thought, well, I trust you. I like you. Yes. Uh, and I saw her for quite some time. And then, and then I moved away and, and, and I had to leave that mental health authority. So I didn't see her anymore. Uh, and then about 10 or 12 years later, it was quite some time later, I was at the theatre doing pantomime and there was a letter uh, came for me. And it was asking me and other members of the cast to go and visit, strangely, a dementia ward in Bath to, to go and spend some time with the dementia patients. And the name at the bottom of the letter was the same name as the therapist that I'd seen. And my heart sort of beat quicker because I hadn't heard that name or that it's, you know because you have a strange relationship with these people you, you don't want to meet, meet them in the street they know everything about you you know yes. um, uh, and I thought oh gosh it, it, it's, it's her she's obviously changed field slightly or, or moved somewhere else in, in the uh, in the NHS and I thought well I want to do this I want to go this is way before my mum's diagnosis but I thought I'd like to do that I'd like to go and um, hang out for, a, for an hour or so and have a cup of tea with these people and, uh, and see if we can uh, you know help um and it was just me and Nick Wilton, who plays, plays the dame, has done since Chris, Chris's house is passing. Uh, and so we turned up early for work and we put on our costumes and then somebody from the theatre drove us up to the, to the hospital. And I hadn't said to them that I, that I know this lady. And I wasn't even going to, I wasn't going to pretend that I knew her. I thought, no, I, does she remember me? I remember her. Because there was no mention of it in the letter. So it, I was quite uptight about the whole meeting her again. And, and we met, and she sort of gave me a hug, and, I was, and, and there, was, there was a sort of slight exchange of, don't say anything. Um, I don't know, it was just odd. But anyway, I was chatting to these patients and, and their carers, and that was lovely. And then we sat down for a cup of tea, and she came, by, she came around with a trolley, and she came around behind me. And, um, and she, she put the, uh, 
the cup of tea down in front of me. And, and as she did, she just whispered in my ear, how's the carburetor? <laughs> and I said, it's okay, thanks. And she just sort of gave me a little squeeze on the shoulder. And that was that. And, and, but she was important. Yeah, she, she played a, 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 a key role in, 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 at a difficult point. So I'll, I'll, add, I'll add her, nameless as she is. And I think the, the sort of mantra of how's the carburetor, is that something you always check in on your own mental health with now because of that sort of... No, not really. No, that's, that's something very much just tied to her, really. I mean, I don't know why I asked that question at the time. Yeah. I don't know where it came from. But, um, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's not something I, I, I sort of return to. It's just... But it was, I think it just showed her, her, um, her uh, compassion and how good she was at her job yes. that she remembered. Yeah. That she remembered the obtuse to bring you back Yeah, in, no, it was, very, it was very touching at the time. Yeah. Yes, lovely answer. OK, now we're on to uh, three things that inspire you. If there's any overlap, that's completely fine, but three okay. things that now inspire you. Uh, well, we'll go with music. Got to be music. Again, surely everybody picks Music, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's just such a mood changer. I mean, um, I mean, I've always got music playing in my dressing room before a show, so, some sort of funereal march. Um, <laughs> you know, something relatively up tempo. Um, yeah, in music, it's just, it's just, it just changes, it changes your world. I think. I mean, more than more than more than books or poetry or art for me, music. It's that instant. It's, it's an instant uh, fix, or, or it can be. You know, and sometimes if you're feeling sad, you, you want to uh, wallow in it and you'll yes. you'll put on some really dreadful, dirgy, sad music. You'll put on some James Blunt and wallow away and drown in it or, or, or not. Uh, but they yeah, are some sort of... So music will be something that inspires me. Um, strangely, sporting achievement. And I am the world's least sporty person. Let me list to you. I have been rescued skiing. I have been, <laughs> I have been rescued orienteering. I had been rescued swimming twice. Uh, I did the long jump at school and was taken to Swindon Hospital with heat exhaustion. Um, I had been rescued canoeing and I had been rescued abseiling. Yeah, I think that's it. Um, I'm not, I am not a sporty... I think people obviously like you. They keep, they keep, they, <laughs> they keep saving me. They keep me. rescuing you. <laughs> yes, I know, yeah. Abseiling, I just leant back too far and I ended up hanging upside down on this cliff face. They just had to sort of winch me up <laughs> in, in front of the whole school. And it was, oh, God. Yeah, I was always the person picked last for the... For the actually, no, second last. There was one person worse than me. Um, and so, and so, so when I see, and I like sport, because I, I see sport as drama. If you watch a, a, a football match, if it's dull, it's, I'd switch it off. But if it's, a, if it's a, exciting, it can be darts, it can be snooker, it can be tennis, it can be rugby. If it's exciting and it's drama and there's an underdog and there's a villain and there's whatever, there's controversial decisions, it's brilliant. Um, but when I see you know, Andy Murray the other week in, yes, the, in yes, the Australian wow. Open, I mean, my God, that level of... of determination yes. and drive, which I don't have. I'm not a very driven individual. But that level of, of, of drive and desire and guts, I, I think, is astonishing. And, I, you know, when I watch the Olympics or whatever, it doesn't matter what the sport is, what nationality, who they are, what they've done, if they're there on the podium and the, their national anthem starts playing and the tears spring in their eyes, well, I'm gone. I mean, I'm, I'm an absolute wreck. I mean, are you a subscriber to all the sports channels so you're always looking for that opportunity? Um, uh, no, because they're so expensive. I, but I, I, do, <laughs> I do have, yes, yeah, some of the Sky Sports. Um, I mean, I, but, you know, it, it doesn't inspire me to the point of playing sport. Yes. I want, I want to make that distinction very, <laughs> clear. very clear. I, I, I've not ever picked up a tennis racket <laughs> or, a, or, a, or, a, or a golf club or whatever. So, no, I won't play this, the, the awful stuff. But I, but I just like getting rescued. <laughs> I, just, I just like the, the firm arms of a lifeguard. It's, um, <laughs> <laughs> I, see, I see what you've done. Yes, you're right. Um, uh, yes, but, but I, it's, it's, some, it's something that I will never achieve. And I, and I, and I those it's that do... It's a vicarious I, enjoyment. Yeah, I doff my cap to them because I, I think it's... I, I don't know how they do it. It's, it's astonishing. UK Health Radio. The station that makes you feel good. The station that makes you feel good. That's a great inspirational. Any yep. other inspiration? Um, so my, and my third and, and last one would be, um, I, I think it would be carers. Uh, rather, uh, well, not, well why, is, why is that odd? But I, I guess because in recent years, because of my, my mother's situation and what my 
father now does day in, day out, 24-7. And my husband, Dean, has become his mother's carer. I think as I've got older, I, I have just developed a, a, a real sense of, of admiration uh, uh, for people who do that yes. and, and the selflessness of it. So I, I, I find, you know, because I witness it close hand, I, I find it very um, extraordinary and, and, and moving and just wonderful. So, um, uh, yeah, I'll put and, and anybody in that bracket who sort of who cares for a loved one um, 24-7 is, is, a, is a hero in my book. And now we're going to talk about uh, two uh, squirrels of distraction. So okay. here is a random squirrel. Oh, squirrels. Ooh, squirrel. Yep. And, uh, oh, God. <laughs> oh, squirrels. I need to be rescued again. I've been attacked by a squirrel. So borrowed from the film Up, it's a bit that moment when the dog goes, oh, squirrels. Yeah. So what are the two squirrels or, or monsters of distraction for you that never fail to grab your attention, whatever else is going on for you? Um, dogs. Love a dog. If this had been a dog, I'd only be looking at it. Not, not a squirrel. I love a dog. I, I, I have a dog. I'm a dog lover. Can't stand cats. I'm not one of the, I'm not, oh, no, I like cats and dogs. No, cats are evil. Um, <laughs> ooh, awful things. Um, but dogs, dogs, dogs. We don't dogs. deserve dogs. Dogs. I can't pass a dog without, without you know... Eating it. <laughs> <laughs> without kicking it. No, I can't, I can't pass a dog without, without stroking it and, and chatting to it. And I, and I care not a jot about the owner. But, um, but I've, I've only got eyes for the dog. Yeah, so I love dogs. And and talk it, us through Hamish, he's a Scotty. Hamish, Hamish is our West Highland White Terrier. Uh, yeah, oh, he, does, is, that, is that a Scotty? Or um, that up? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Not really, no. Scotties are no. normally, normally <laughs> black, black, aren't they? Yeah. So no, he's a, he's a Westie. Uh, my parents had Westies, so when, when we got a dog, I wanted a Westie. They had Dougal, and then they had Nessie, after the Loch Ness Monster. So we wanted to keep the Scottish tradition, because my dad's Scottish. So, um, so we called him uh, Hamish. Uh, and and he's, he's, a, well, he's a little git, to be honest. But I, but I, but I, <laughs> he's almost a cat. <laughs> well, no, I, I, it's just because we, we've sport. You know, obviously, we, we don't have children. Um, but, so he, we sport in Rotten, and we've ruined our lives as a result. I mean, <laughs> I, I remember when we first got him, you know, he's not allowed upstairs. And then he was ill. So, no, OK, you can come upstairs. Well, he's not allowed on the bed. Well, OK, well, no, he's on the bed. Well, now he's practically in his own pair of pyjamas smoking <laughs> a cigarette. <laughs> I mean, he's got a no coward smoking. Yeah, absolutely. You wake up in the morning and he's there, and, and um, so yeah, he, he does whatever he wants, and we are um, yeah, slaves. He's slaves, but he's adorable. So dogs, I love dogs. Yeah, dogs be one. Um, and and uh, uh, the other thing of distract buttons. Yeah, not as in the pantomime. Not in the, not in the buttons, or indeed the, the fastenings on a garment. Uh, I, I love a button, um, and I've, I've been looking at those buttons there. I, um, I love a gadget. I, I just want to press a button. I so want to press a button. You should so never bad. be the president of the United never. States. Never. And it's and it's a <laughs> <laughs> it's a really good job that they don't let people into cockpits anymore. Because I would. <laughs> I mean, I would just, uh, but when I and when I used to work in television, I loved the gallery. You know, the, the gallery industry with, with faders and buttons, and and they, and they lit up, and then you pulled those down, and, and uh, like recording studios. Yeah. I, I find those places fascinating. In fact, when we, well, I did when when we, when we arrived here this evening, the first thing I did was was gravitate towards that was the desk. It's buttons. And you played with Peter Slider. I did. I love yeah. a button. Yes. Yes. So thank you. That's yeah. really clear. I, I, yeah. And if it, if there's a button which says do not press. <coughs> oh. Do you like my buttons? Well, no, no, that's the wrong kind of button. Unless oh, okay. it does something. Does it do anything if I press it? No, it just irritates me because you're pressing my button. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not interested. No, but if it's, if it's a button or a switch when I don't know what that switch does. Oh, OK, OK. I need to know what that switch does. Yes. Ah. So are you turning lights on and off and off and on and off? Well, and once on I've on. discovered, oh, it turns on the light, then I'm, I'm, I'm kind of over it. But, but if so it's, this isn't an OCD thing. Yeah, it's, no, it's not, I don't, no, I don't stand there <laughs> all day long, you know, giving myself an, an epileptic fit by strobing the, my own light. No, I, I, just, I just love a button and see what it does and switch, switches, gadgets, buttons, buttons. I love buttons. Get into your head, man. I like a button. He likes a button. And you are buttons. You have been buttons I have many been, times. I have been you buttons. See what I did there? I did, exactly. Lovely segue. Uh, yes, no, I have, I, have, I have. And buttons is the best. Buttons, I think, is my favourite. Um, Panto uh, character. And in fact, that. I think, coming full circle, that's the first time I ever saw you in pantomime with Chris Harris. I know that it wasn't Bristol, but it was the Bath Theatre yeah, World, yeah. you clarified that, but it was you, you were Buttons. Yes, Buttons is a nice part to play, because, because uh, all the other parts of Wishy Washy and Silly Billy and Idle Jack and, and Models and whatever, whatever else, um, they're basically the village idiot. Um, but, but, um, <laughs> I've cast again, dear. Yeah. So, yeah. But, um, but, but, uh, Buttons has, has Buttons is in love with Cinderella, and that love is unrequited, and so 
there's a whole other layer to him, and you can play with that 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 empathy with the audience and and that rejection and get sympathy. By the way, our word cloud will be saying buttons at the moment. It's, it's brought to you yes, by I, the I've said buttons. it far too many times. I won't worry. <laughs> I'm like hoping to get sponsored by Cadbury. Yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> um, so, so he's a, he's a nice part to play because there's, there's just a bit more a bit more material as an actor to yes. to, to work with. Yeah. And now uh, the one is a quirky or unusual fact about you, uh, John Money. We couldn't know until you tell us. Well, I don't think people will know this, and why would you? But I have sung backing vocals on the Wurzels albums. <laughs> you see, you didn't know that, did you? And I can tell by that ripple of fascination. That was a, that, that had a plural. That albums. Oh yeah, it? I did more than one. I was asked back. Actually, no, I don't think I was asked at all. It was. Uh, it was uh, <laughs> <laughs> you stalked the Wurzels. No, it was. A, it was a friend of mine. It, uh, we did it for my birthday present. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a strange birthday present. A friend of mine knew the, uh, the, uh, the producer and, and keyboardist for, for the Wurzels, and they were doing an album, and they were looking for some people to sing backing vocals. Because you didn't really need to be able to sing. You just had to sort of put on a, a West Country accent and... and Sit in a combine harvest. And, and go, and, and, and yeah. make all these noises. Uh, and sing bits. And, and she said, well, we can get a group of friends together. We'll do it for John's birthday. It'll be a surprise. And, and so they said, that we've got a surprise. We're going to take you somewhere on, on, on your birthday. And I, and I, and I thought I was going, yeah. I don't know, go-karting or, or, or paintballing or hopefully not abseiling. But I thought I was doing something. <laughs> somewhere to be rescued. Something like, I said, do I need to put on, do I need Wellington boots? Do I need, do I need a hard hat? And they're like, no, no, no. But we just took some cans of cider and drove out to a recording studio uh, in Wiltshire and then laid down some tracks. <laughs> but it was, it. it was enormous fun. I and mean, we laughed a lot. So, um, but yes, it's, it's, it's a strange thing on one's. CV, I suppose. And they liked you back and wanted you. Yeah, and no, then we did the Christmas album as well. <laughs> very good. Very good. That's yeah. a very lovely, quirky yeah. fact. There you go. So we have shaken the canopy of your tree, yes. John. And now we're going to move away from the tree and we're going to talk about alchemy and gold. Please. Lovely. That's a nice This point. is uh, well, That's not be, real, is it? Well, it, it would be heavier than yeah, that. That's but true. It's, it's a, May it, I? Yes, you can. So alchemy and gold, John, is when you're at purpose... An inflow. Yes. What are you absolutely happiest doing? Uh, I would say, I would say, um, well, if it's not any of those things like lying on a lilo and listening to early Genesis, um, I, I guess, I guess improvising would be something, you know, which, which I do with you. Yeah. But, that, but you'll, you'll be aware that that moment when you are riffing and it's and it's effortless and everything is falling into place and you're not struggling for the word or panicking about yeah. where this is going but when you when you hit that rich seam of of invention that's of gold of, of gold that. that's yes. that's that's a very nice state to be in and, and i think the other the other moment that i thought of that i would choose would be in the middle of a comic pause is a nice place to be and it's not a long and and, and 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 pauses for comic effect don't tend to be long pauses. You know, it's a beat, isn't it? I mean, in comedy, you don't get many twenty-second um, long comic pauses. We can try but one. We could try one, but <laughs> they, we'd probably fall off the air. You know, <laughs> the caller has hung up, and they would just the line would go dead. But uh, no, but there's we did um uh, in the in Aladdin just finished. So uh, there was a joke which I wrote in the script, um, where this probably won't work in this context, but where Abanaza is trying to prove that he's a magician. And he says to me, um, so think of a card, any card. And I say, any card? Yes, any card. Have you got one? Yes, I've got one. And then he says, I'm going to read your mind. And he, and he pulls out a playing card. Is this your card? And I go, no. And he goes, is this your card? And I go, no. And he pulls out another playing card. Is this your card? No. And he pulls out the rest of the deck. Is this your card? Is this your card? Is this your card? Is this your card? And I go, no, 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 no. And he said, ah, I give up. What was the card? And I said, get well soon. And that was the joke, and it, and, it, and it always, get, but it always got a guaranteed laugh. It was one of the one of the guaranteed laughs in the show. Uh, but but what was nice was that was was the pause before the get well soon. That was a lovely moment. Not the not the get well soon, but the pause. And the pause was that's a. It's like landing a plane. You know, just like that. Well, yes. it's but it is. But it's because you're you 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 don't want to come in too hard on the landing. You don't want to you don't want to you don't want to take too long because you'll run out a runway. It's 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 a moment of, of of instinct and focus, and you're not thinking about anything else. You're just thinking about and you and you place the line there, bang, and and to try and get the biggest reaction because the audience knows that this is, the whole routine is building up to this moment, and yes. they sense here it comes. This is the moment, and you've got that beat, and you can keep them a little while longer. Do you know? What I mean? It's just a nice moment. It's, it happens very very quickly. It's, it's yes. a heartbeat. 
you it's, know, the, it's the truth. absolute quintessence of comic timing. Yeah, but but it's yeah. it, it's just fun to be in that moment to go. Can I push it a bit more? Have I have I have I waited too long? It's just uh, and that's all I'm thinking about at that moment. You know, nothing else is 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 in my in my brain whatsoever. But it's just a nice moment. Lovely answer. A bit a bit a bit wanky, but it's nice. Yeah. No, I liked it. Okay. And now. I'm going to award you a bit of, bit of cake, John. Woo! So um, I'm going to throw this at you. So th- this is, it's a literal cake, but I'm going to talk about a metaphorical cake now. Um, you'll see where I'm going with this. This is another multi-layered cake storytelling metaphor. Hamish you get would to love put, that. You can't have it. It's, okay. I need it for the show. Okay. Yeah. So you're going to get to put a cherry on the cake. Yes. And this is now stuff like... So first of all, do you like cake, John? I do like cake, but I, I'm, I'm pleased to see this has a lot of cream filling. I've got a very dry palate. Have you? Yeah, I take after my father. And if my father has a bit of cake... He, I would often hear him say to um, Jane, my mother, Jane, I need to wet it up a bit. And that was his phrase. We need to, I need to wet it up a bit. It's a strange, <laughs> which you don't ever really want to hear your father saying, but he, he, that's what he used to say <laughs> at, the, at, the, at the dinner table. And so he, he would need some cream or some custard or some ice cream or something because the cake would be too clacky. And I'm the same, too clacky. So it has to be airy and, and, and have a lot of cream or custard or wet ice it up cream. A bit. Yeah. But that, exactly. that seems okay. So, yeah, cake's fine. So using that metaphor, it's now what's a favourite inspirational quote that's always given you sucker and yep. pulled you towards your future? And, 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 it could be what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? We, we had a bit of a riff about this yesterday. Yes. I don't know if you're going to go there. <laughs> I'm not what's the go best there. piece of advice you've ever been given? <laughs> and then we're going to ramp up eventually to a bit of Shakespeare where we'll talk about legacy and okay. how you'd most like to be remembered. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to that slightly differently. Okay. So um, it's open to you to interpret. So first of all, let's go with... Your favourite, ins- an, an inspirational quote that's always given you sucker. I don't like them. I don't like inspirational quotes. But people who put inspirational quotes all the time on Facebook, I will block them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, I will, I will just, I mean, I, uh, I, I mean, they sound nice, don't they? But, but the, it's things like, you know, uh, don't wait for the storm to pass, learn to dance in the rain. Well, that's ridiculous. You'll get hit by lightning. I mean, it's just... <laughs> nice. it's, it's, I mean, it's, and it's, well, they'll, they'll live every day like it's your last. I mean, if we all did that, it would be chaos out there. Absolutely <laughs> mayhem. No one would running around like headless chickens. Yes. You can't live you can't each day like it's, it no, like it's, like it's your life. So they always sound nice, but I always find them a bit... Yeah, so I'm not... A, I, 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 the, the one quote I do like is, is George Bernard Shaw's, which is, never wrestle with a pig. You both get dirty and the pig likes it. I, I like that quote, but I don't, think, I don't think it's particularly inspirational. No, I liked it and I found it inspirational. <laughs> oh, well, well I liked I'm annoyed. It. Uh, so let's go with the best piece of advice you've ever been given. Um, don't put lemon juice in your hair. <laughs> and I didn't. That, if I could go back in time, I, would, I, would, I went on holiday and, I, and I, I wanted my hair to be blonder. So I tried to use sun in, which is this sort of chemical. And yeah. it, d- it did nothing. So then I thought I'd do sun in and lemon juice. Ooh, uh. and, and, then, and it still seemed to do nothing. So I, I really went for it. I, I, and, and then I just, bang, wallet, went bright orange. Whoa. And Is that because of the chemical reaction yeah. with the other stuff and the lemon or yeah it, just it, just, lemon? it was just horrendous so if i could go back in time and give myself is that what you're asking if i could give myself some advice or was it just any advice oh that's ne- that's the next thing so oh, i've done the wrong question no no what's the, that, that's great the best piece of advice is don't put lemon in your hair this isn't live is it yeah so if i could yeah, if i could go back in time we can edit this out if here, i could yeah. go back in time i would say don't put lemon juice in your hair because it was a, a, a yeah a humiliating people tell me they liked it but i could see in their eyes you went the orange you said I, it just went bright I, I, you remember beaker and the muppets it was that sort of he's my favorite muppet it was that shade of orange i mean congratulations you know. <laughs> thank you so yes uh, that's what I would go back and tell myself. Uh, but a, a good piece of advice given uh, would be look up. Okay, what, pourquoi? Well, just because I, I you, cause you notice more. I, I spend I, a lot of my time head yeah. down, walk, you know, walking, you know, when you're walking around town, head down, you know, elbows out, keep away, whatever. Do you know what I mean? I'm, I'm yeah. sort of a, a not, an, not an angry person by any means, but, I, but somebody I remember saying, look up more. Um, because there's things you just don't notice, to, to either in architecture more. or in, in, in the trees or in the sky or whatever. So we, we spend a, nice we spend a lot of our time looking at down here, but but just look up a bit. That is a nice answer. I was thinking look up because of the comedy of a piano falling on your head, but actually it was more no, no, about no, no. look it up was, to it appreciate. Was, no, yeah, it was yes, it was more meaningful than than the, than the nonsense you were spouting. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, what would you offer yourself? What would, I'll start that sentence again. We can edit this okay. as well. <laughs> yes, in what English? notes? Yes, now. Conjoining with English, uh, what notes, help, or advice would you proffer to a younger version of yourself? 
Well, that's that's the don't put lemon juice in your oh, hair. Oh, it's that, the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Yes, you've got me on a technicality there. Yeah, it's the same. Yeah, 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 you know, yeah, it's meant yeah, to be yeah, different. Yeah, you've been gripped in the jaws of reason. Sorry. Lovely. Okay, we're going to get to some Shakespeare, but um, instead now we're yeah. going to get there through this moment, which is now um, with the creaky comedy share. This is called "Pass the Baton, Please." Okay. okay. So pass the golden baton. Right. Thank so you. I'm going to give that to you. So. Um, who in your network, in amongst those that you know, would you most like to pass the baton on to to keep the golden thread of this construct going? And to do this way? sort of thing. Okay. Um, well, I would, have, I would have picked, obviously, Chris Harris. He would have been my, my, my number one choice. He's a fascinating man. So, oh, see, Sally no longer with us. Um, so I will suggest uh, Nick Wilton, um, because he, uh, who, who is a wonderful pantomime dame and cut from a similar cloth to Chris Harris. In fact, it was Chris Harris that inspired Nick to be a dame. Nick saw ah, Chris yes. play dame, and that's when he thought, oh, I want to do that. Um, which is why I think he's been a, a good fit for Bath. So, but he had a whole career before Panto. I mean, he won the Edinburgh Award for comedy, and, yep. and uh, number 73 of the kids' show with um, Sandy Toxvig and Jasper Carrot in the 80s, live on Saturday night. He was part of the, his troupe, and he's, he's written comedy and stuff. So he's a fascinating chap. So I would suggest him, and, and also... Uh, uh, Somebody I know who's not really a friend of mine, we, we haven't met very often, but is Nick Steele. <coughs> Excuse me. Nick Steele, who runs uh, the Bath Comedy Festival. Oh, but okay. I, I've only met him a few times, but he's, a, he's just a larger-than-life character, and you kind of think he'd be fun to, to, to chew the fat with. So I will suggest... No, those thank you very much, because you've given me a bog off of buy one, get one yeah, free, yeah. please. So thank you very well, much. Well, I can put you in touch. Thanks very much. Yeah. Uh, so now, mm -hmm. thank you for that, sincerely, and your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to furnish me a warm introduction to them so they, they don't have to say yes, it's an open question, yes or no is okay, fine. Of course, yeah. I love that mantra, until you ask the question, the answer is always no. Yeah. Sorry, the answer, well, until you've asked the question. Yeah, I understand. That's probably a quote you don't like. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, don't put and it on now, Facebook. <laughs> inspired by Shakespeare. By the way, what's delicious about me getting this out of the cupboard a week ago, this is my own personal original thumbed when I went to drama school at wow. circa 1986, um, complete works of Shakespeare. Nice. So I thought it would be the right prop turning this into a show. So inspired by all the world's stage and all the men and women, merely players, what I'm finally going to ask you to do, John, is we're going to talk about legacy and how, when all is said and done, there's a sound effect coming, you'd most like to be remembered. Oh, right. you're doing the sound effect. I did that. <laughs> that was me with my own mouth. So how would you most like to be remembered, John Mooney? Uh, it's, what are, I mean, that's an awful question. Oh, shut your face. Isn't it? Well, we're not an awful <laughs> question. But, but I, I, I don't know. I, I don't, I'm not that bothered. Um, and nor are we. No, <laughs> <we're not. laughs> but, um, but, you know, you, I think you have to have done something. I mean, to be remembered, remembered, you've got to have done something of, of, of value and, and, and importance. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I remember Paul Eddington, the actor from um, uh, Yes Minister and The Good Life or whatever, because I think he died of skin cancer, and there was an interview with him when he knew he was dying, and they asked him that question, and he said, uh, you know, what would he like to, on his tombstone? And he said, uh, he never did anyone any harm. And I like that. Yes. That's, that's enough for me. Nice. So, yeah. There we are. And now, as this has been your moment in the sunshine, in the good listening to show, is there anything else you'd like to say, John Mooney? Um, how long have we got? No, we, uh, yeah, well, let, no, there was an anecdote which I thought was going to come up. Uh, sorry, yeah. But it hasn't, so I can tell this story. Yes, please, yes, please. Because normally you get asked, what's the worst thing that's ever happened to you on stage? <laughs> that's always a question that you always get uh, as an actor. I forgot to ask that one. Well, no, no, I don't know, but, but, I, <laughs> but yeah, strangely, and I, and I did some filming on a... On a uh, BBC drama last year, and that we were all in the green room, all the actors. Uh, and that you know, when, when actors get together, they, they talk about themselves because that's what actors do. <laughs> we're terribly conceited like that. And, and, and the question came up what's the worst thing that's ever happened to you on stage? And when that question does come up, I just sit back and I let everybody tell their anecdote. And then when all eyes were slowly turned to me, I lean forward and whisper, Buckle up, kids. <laughs> because, <laughs> because no one has ever had a worse, a worse anecdote than this. And um, I just want to check they're not here. No, OK. Um, and it, so it was, it was in, in, in pantomime. And this is only funny now. It wasn't funny at the time. I want to stress that. It wasn't funny at the time. I'm making too much of this. But it was, uh, so it, towards the end of pantomime, we do something called the song sheet. Uh, which effectively is, is a front cloth routine where we get some children out of the audience and, it, and its sole purpose really is to change the set behind into the big finale walk down. Um, and so we, and we get these 
kids from the audience, they're, 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 they're picked by the ushers in the stalls. Sometimes they, they parents ask, sometimes we have to find them or whatever. Um, and, uh, and they come up on stage one by one and we have a little interview and we do a song. Uh, and we normally put the cutest child... Were you there that night? So you're laughing. <laughs> we normally put the cutest child at the end. Either at the beginning, or the the either, either first or fourth, because yeah. they, they get all the, you know, the, 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 the ooh factor, the ooh and ah factor from the audience. So these four children are coming up on stage, and, uh, and at the front was this, was this four-year-old girl, and she was very lively. She'd been at the Haribo. She was, she was, you know, she <laughs> was really, she was flying. Um, and, and I was, so my attention was, was, solely on her because there, there's cables and there's pyros and there's lights and it's and there's an orchestra pit and so I was really watching her so she comes up first uh, and then there was a slightly older girl I think behind her and then rather bizarrely there was a there was a, a, an older lad again probably about eight or nine and he was strangely on crutches but he was doing fine he was fine so he's there and then there was another boy at the end uh, and so I got the four all lined up and I went and chatted to the to the little girl and I do my usual questions about you know, hello, what, what's your name and, and how old are you and are you married and all, all these sort of <laughs> set lines that you have up your sleeve. Uh, I had a chat with them and I had a chat with the next girl and then I turned to the lad on the crutches and I said, so what have you done? And that's when I noticed he only had one leg. You see? You see? Now you know yeah. why it was my worst moment on, on stage. Now, in my defence, he had a pair of jeans on. But there wasn't a lot going on in the left jean, which I hadn't noticed. He had, he had a pair of trousers on. But that, and, I, and I sort of said, what have you Because I presumed he'd strained his ankle or something, playing or football skiing, or skateboarding yeah. or something like that, or abseiling. And I said, um, so yeah, so what have you done? And he never said a word the entire time he was on stage. Because some kids, when they get on stage, they go a bit nil by mouth. The lights hit them and they, and they, and they clam up. <laughs> and he never said a word. But I said, so what have you done? And he just sort of grinned benignly at me. And that's when I noticed he only had one leg. And I, and I felt the temperature change in the theatre. <laughs> you felt that collective intake of breath. You know, uh, um, the, the air pressure changed dramatically. And, I, and my brain froze. It was a moment of absolute terror. I thought, oh, my... And I couldn't... I, oh, you know that the duck on the water, but the, the, the feet are doing that? That's, that's what I was doing. And absolutely panicking. And I thought, oh, oh, oh. And I... And I <laughs> And I thought, right, get, get this back on track. So, I, so I, I went back to my questions. So I went, so, what do you want for Christmas? And again, he just smiled and sort of just shrugged. And so I reached for my go-to line, which is a Chris Harris line. When I ask a child what they want for Christmas and they, and they haven't got an answer, I pluck this sort of pre-prepared line from up my sleeve. And I said, socks. <laughs> 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 and I didn't know I'd said it. I mean, I was, I was in such a state... I was in such a state of panic. <laughs> I was such, such a... You know, get this back on track. Get, you know, get back to the... I said, what do you want for Christmas? And he just... And, and, and then... Uh, and then my... And, and, and I'm doing this whole routine on stage. And in my head, I'm just screaming, he's only got one leg. <laughs> what have you done? I, I mean, I was, I was furious with myself and, and upset for him. And, and it, was, I, it was an awful moment. And then we finished the routine and, and round of applause and off they went off. And I ran into the wings and I said, because normally you get warned. Normally you get a note saying, just to let you know, one of the children coming up on stage uh, has um, you know, difficulties with their sight or whatever. They might yes. have a guardian with them or a parent with them or they're hard of hearing or whatever. So you, you do get a bit of uh, sort of pre-warning. But, the, but the, the, the ushers hadn't noticed either that he only had one leg. Um, and I said, nobody told me he only had one leg. And I remember this uh, friend of mine, Jackson, who was a member of the stage crew, said, yeah. Then you asked him if he wanted socks for Christmas. <laughs> and I said... <laughs> I said, did I? Did, did I? And he said, mm. I said, oh, God, I did. And, and, I, and, and, and I, I went into my dressing room and I, and I, I, I sobbed. I was so upset with myself. Oh. I was so upset that, you know, this family, this child has come out to have a, have a good time and, and forget about all his troubles. And now I've just pointed out his disability to a thousand people, you know, and, 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 I, and I felt so, so bad. Uh, but apparently his parents were, had a lovely time and they thanked the ushers on the way out and they had a great, you know, they, they, they didn't bat an eye, they didn't bother him in the slightest and, and but but yes um, and I, ironically it was so on the edge it was probably perfect because that's actually the darkest most perfect thing you could say to sort of make light of so i get it i, think I don't know I, I don't know i'd like to think maybe that's I kind you're channeling chris <laughs> harris to, for a moment of genius but probably. as a worst moment ever on stage yeah that that i will i hope i never beat it
because it was, it was the most dreadful moment. And so now when we do the song sheet and children come up and say, I pat them down. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So in a moment, we're going to open up to uh, any questions from the audience. But just to bring this part of you know, the rest of this journey before we know, we've got a virtue of the fact we've got a, a live audience who we can interact with a bit further for any questions they may have for John. But ladies and gentlemen, this has been John Money's Story of Distinction and Genius. Thank you for listening, John Money, and a good night. And now, uh, if you're still watching on the internet and Facebook, please do so. We're going to do a bit of a spontaneous Q&A now. So um, does anybody have any questions? I've got this wonderful microphone soft um, cube, wow. which doesn't hurt. I can chuck it at you. <laughs> and if you've got any questions to ask of John or me, but mostly John, I will throw this at you. So I love the fact you're right up the back. So uh, <laughs> apologies if this conks you on, on the head. It won't hurt. What's your name, madam? Lucy. Is the right answer. Everyone's a winner. Here it comes, Lucy. Good catch. Well, hell. Over to you, Lucy. So um, I also watched Aladdin this year. I thought it was very, very funny, and I did want to congratulate you, so thank you very much. It's probably the least racist version of Aladdin I've ever seen, so well done. Well, I'm pleased to hear that. Thank you. So um, when you choose, because I know you've written a couple of pantos, what made you choose to do Aladdin um, over many of the others that are available? It's not my choice. Um, it's, it's really not my choice. So that's a, that's a discussion which takes place between uh, the producers, which is called UK Productions. They have the contract at Bath. And a dis- so a discussion between them and Danny Moore, who is the theatre manager at the Theatre Hall. So they will see what it is they've, what they did last year, what they did the year before that. So they, they, tend, to, they tend to move in a, in a cycle. Uh, and the one we haven't done for the longest is Sleeping Beauty, which is why that's this Christmas. And it really should have been last Christmas, but Sleeping Beauty was probably too close to Cinderella. They're both sort of of a similar nature. Um, so so they, they, they're always looking for a mix of the, of the romantic ones and the more adventurous ones. I mean, wrongly, they, they, they have been in the past sort of segregated into a, a boy's panto and a girl's panto, and we don't like to use that distinction anymore. But there are, there are some which are more sort of romantic love story led and there are others which are sort of like Jack and the Beanstalk or, or Dick Whittington which are sort of adventures of, of, of discovery and some of them managed to combine the two quite well so Aladdin being a more a sort of um, uh, roller coaster high stakes adventure now now they're doing Sleeping Beauty which is more of a, um, a fairy tale in that sort of tra- traditional sense of, of love and princes and princesses and things so um, yeah it's not my decision I, I, I simply do what I'm what I'm told. But one of, one of the nice things about uh, having been at Bath for so long is that I don't do the same thing each year. They, they, they move around, whereas a lot of friends of mine who do Ugly Sisters, for example, or who, who, or who play squires or, or kings, you know, they, they will move around with a production for a few years. So they will do Ugly Sisters in Bath, and then the next year they'll do the same script in Basingstoke, and then they'll do the same script in Sunderland, and then they'll do the same script in Rill. So they, they, you know, so they, it, which can become a bit, I suppose boring um uh, but I, i'm i'm fortunate that, that because i stay at the venue i do get a rotation of scripts on a sort of five or six yearly basis but yeah so that i i'd like them to add new ones to the canon but that means they have to create sets and costumes and props and things and and, and it's it, pantomime is expensive but certain certain stories are falling by the wayside so you don't see <coughs> babes in the wood done anymore robinson crusoe doesn't get done much anymore Mother Goose doesn't get done much anymore, even though Ian McKellen's on tour with it at the moment, because children don't know the stories so well. Um, but, but if it's been Disneyfied, like Beauty and the Beast, <laughs> then the kids now know the stories. So um, I imagine in years to come they'll be Frozen, the Panto, or Shrek, the Panto. <laughs> but, you know, they'll be those stories will become the pantomime stories. It's sort of constantly evolving. Thank you, Lucy, for your question. A uh, question at the front now. Would you like to hurl it down? Enjoy revenge is a dish best served chucking it back. There we are. Hi. Hello. Um, I n- noticed that uh, we... You've got your hands on the microphone. Just there we go. <laughs> I didn't think it was that effective. Maybe it is. Um, uh, I noticed that the lead man tends to be played by a man these days, whereas it used to be played by a girl. And I just wondered if you knew why or Yeah, I think there happened. was something... Because it wasn't always... I don't know. I could be wrong. Uh, um, I mean, the tradition of a, of a Dane being played by a man is, is, is you know, a long, long, long-standing tradition. The, the whole principal boy being a woman, I think that came in you know, relatively recently compared to the, to, the, to the really old traditions of pantomime, primarily to sort of to give, to give 
dance a bit of leg. I think that was really why it was there. You know, these, these sort of, um, you know, uh, attractive women in short tunics and, and, and long legs. Um, and, and, and it has, it has died out. Some, some people still do it, but I'd, I've only... I think we did it once in Cinderella. We had a prince and a dandini, which were both played by, by women. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I think it's possibly because it's slightly sexist. It's a, it's a funny thing because pantomime is not the most um, politically correct <laughs> genre <laughs> of, <laughs> of, of, of theatre. And, th- and that's what some people love about it. And that's, that's sort of you know, part of its tradition and its heritage. But then you know, times are changing and you have to respect that and move with it. And, so, and, and, as, and as you said with, with Aladdin, I mean, we, we, we tried to be very careful. That we, the producer said to me, um, we're not going to set this in China. We're going to take out all the references of China. We got rid of the characters of, of, the, of the Chinese policeman, which is often called PC Pong, which, which, which <laughs> uh, that name went. We got rid of that. Um, uh, so we just sort of set it in a, in a, in a, in a faraway land. But we, you know, not calling it old Peking or Peking, because that gets productions quite rightly in, into trouble. Um, so, but then the set looked very oriental because they didn't change the set. Um, because <laughs> 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 but that's that's nothing, that's above my pay grade. Um, I have nothing to do with that. So so we, yeah, we try to be sensitive to, to those issues. But it's a, I don't I, yeah, I don't know where the, it's difficult to know where the lines are anymore because some people don't think a dame should be played by a, by a man. It should be a woman. You know that you are sort of somehow, um, uh, you know, you've crossed a line and it's mm. it's not it's not the right thing to do anymore. Which I disagree with because I think it's it's just a tradition. Yes. The dame is simply a theatrical t- tradition. It's played by a man. Um, we're not trying to, you know... Um, and as you say, Ian McKellen is doing that as we... Well, they've just finished the production of Mother yes, Goose. Yes, yeah, he's doing Mother Goose at the moment. It's on tour. Yeah. So um, uh, I forgot what the question was. I don't, I don't know, but um, <laughs> yeah, I, it, it doesn't seem to be the done thing anymore. You know, I think Panto does go through sort of vogues. And, and but the amateur ones still tend to... Yeah, possibly because there's, you don't get enough men in amateur dramatics. <laughs> um, you're always, amateur dramatics are always struggling for blokes. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Time for a couple more questions. If anyone else has a question, it was like an auction. You twitched there, but uh, that was just you changing position. <laughs> Madam, do you mind if I throw this to you? No. And what's your name? Cecily. C- Cecily. Cecily. There we are. Wonderful Shakespearean name. <laughs> um, you mentioned doing some work for the BBC last year or recently. I'm fascinated to know what we might see you in. Oh, well, that's been out. Um, that's, oh. been, that's been and gone. So that was something called Show Trial. Which, I mean, blink and you, you'll have missed me. Um, so, I mean, I used to be a TV presenter many, many years ago for HTV, and, and then TV changed and, and my career sort of slowly disappeared, basically. Uh, and and um, my bread and butter was regional television, and regional TV just, just dissolved, um, and ITV sort of amalgamated into one, into one company. Um, and, and reality TV came along and it, and it changed the game for presenters. You, you needed to be a celebrity now rather than just a, a, you know, a, a presenter uh, or an expert. Um, and, I, and I sort of found myself in a, bit, a little bit in the wilderness for a few years. And, then, and it's, only, it's only recently I thought, well, I'll go back to my, to my roots and training and I'll try and, I'll try and do more acting. I mean, I, I, I see pantomime as acting. I don't, some people can be a bit sniffy about pantomime and see it as a poor man's genre of theatre, but I'm very uh, defensive of it. I think it's a wonderful... Um, form of theatre and a very valid genre, um, but I thought I'd like to do a bit more, a bit more acting, either theatre or television. So I've st- I've started doing, just doing bits and bobs. You know, it's a it's a hugely competitive industry, and <coughs> actors are ten a penny. But yeah, I had a little role in something called Show, Show Trial, which was on the BBC. Uh, it was all filmed in Bristol, uh, and then and I did something for um, the Outlaws, which was Stephen Merchant's mm-hmm. comedy. I popped up in that, and I think I'm popping up in something on. Is it Bridgerton you've oh, done Oh, Bridgerton. Well? I'll pop up in Bridgerton next series. Ooh. Again, you know, don't, don't okay. cough. Uh, or, um, <laughs> um, if I may, you're criminally underutilised for your talent in what you're capable well, of Well, tell my you. agent. I, yeah, I'll be on the phone to them tomorrow. Yeah, okay. so whenever, whatever, whatever comes my way. Okay. Thank you so I much, Cecily. I don't know if I can ever get this back to you. You didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Any more for any more. Oh, there's right up the back way, there. You're, you're a temptress, so apologies wow, this again. Is, this is dangerous. Get in. I'm quite, this Fantastic. is a good prop, chaps. Thank you very much. Good, Claudia good Macklin. catch. Well done. What's your name, madam? Uh, Elaine. Elaine, your question, please. Yes. Um, we've been coming to the Panto for quite a few years with our grandchildren, and they spend the rest of the year quoting it to us. I'm so and sorry. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I just wonder how you go about balancing the, the stuff that's for the kids 
and the stuff that's for the parents <laughs> and the, in, the innuendo. It, because I, th they spent last year telling me about my amazing balls. <laughs> <laughs> well, now that's how I want to be remembered. I've got an answer. <laughs> I've finally found an answer. Um, uh, yeah, well, I'm, uh, firstly, I apologise uh, <laughs> for that. It, well, it's difficult. I mean, it's tricky. I mean, it's... it's uh, the, the wonderful thing about pantomime is it, it has the potential to be an absolute... Um, in, in, in entertainment, the, the holy grail is something which is tri-generational. So it's something which appeals to children, parents and grandparents. And it's the same in television. So if something like Doctor Who or something like The X Factor or, or Strictly Come Dancing, something the whole family can get together and watch and, and, and it doesn't you know, alienate any, any group. They all want to watch it. Um, and, and, and pantomime does that and, and, or, or can do that. So what we're trying to do, or I'm trying to do, is I'm trying to appeal to eight-year-olds, 18-year-olds and 80-year-olds. And it's a very fine line to walk and, 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 and hands up, I don't always get it right. You know, sometimes I may push it too far. Or, or, but it's difficult. I'm, I'm, but I'm also aware that it's, you know, some, some people say that it's, it's children's theatre. It's not. The Egg does children's theatre. If you want to see children's theatre, come to the Egg. It's, it's for children. What we're trying to do in the, in the main house in pantomime is, is for the whole family, for that whole age range. Um, I, I'm never trying to offend. I never want to offend. I, I would be upset and I would feel I'd failed if I have offended. But but when it's 40 quid a ticket to sit in the stalls, mm. which it is in Bath, it's not cheap, and I'm well aware of that. You have to provide something for the grown-ups mm. and for the, for the adults, especially as they're the ones who buy the tickets. They don't want, they don't want to sit there for two hours and watch you Peppa Pig. Again. <laughs> you know, and so so I, 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 yeah, I go through it with a fine-tooth comb to see if I've got the balance, to see if I've got enough silly, you know, um, you know, uh, like the, the right-o gag, which is a traditional pantomime gag where someone says, we're going to go do this, right-o, and then we're going to go rescue the princess, right-o, and then we're going to go kill the dragon, right-o. Why do you keep saying right-o? You're just standing on my right-o. And it's, just, it's, a, it's, a, it's just a ridiculous joke. But those are the kind of things the kids love. So you've got to make sure you've got enough of those, but then you've got the other ones as well for the adults. And, and uh, yeah, I just try to try and find that happy medium. But, you know, but it goes obviously through producers and directors who might say too much, pull it back a bit, or, or it's a bit too childish maybe we need a a bit more i think yeah i, I think I, I i certainly have pushed it more in the last few years than 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 what chris chris harris did because i i, I felt it it could go that way yeah. i felt there was room for it but if we ever go too far then we will take stuff back out again because um you know i'm not i'm not um uh, so right no 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 this is the script if it, if it doesn't work or if it's if it's if it's too much we'll we'll take it out by the way, there's a gag I so enjoyed about a riff on days of the week and washing what on which day, and then there was a payoff. Of, do you remember the riff I mean? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. would you be kind enough? Because I just thought that was uh, so brilliant. That was the joke. Well, well, yeah, it was, it was just a, uh, we do different clothes and fabric. We do different clothes, fabrics and stains on different days of the week. Uh, Sundays are undies. Mondays are sundries. Tuesdays are shoes day. And Thursdays are Thursday. Fridays are dry day. And Saturdays are splatter day. Happy now? And then he said, so what do you do on a Wednesday? Have a day off, mate. And I'd push the crest of pipe. <laughs> it was just looking for a payoff. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, that's, that's... And I loved the technique of that because I, I, I was there going, what's happening on a Wednesday? Yeah. got everybody thinking that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah that's the idea. But yeah, so it's, it, yeah, it's, just, it's, it's just a lot of thought, I guess. Yes. I mean, it looks thrown together. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, but, but we, yeah, I, I, I do try to put a lot of thought into it. Um, yes, I think they like the herd of elephants this time. Oh, the herd of elephants yes. joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that, Which yeah. is? I thought that was great. Uh, oh, no, that was why I said, oh, look down there on the plains, a, a, a flock of elephants. And then Aladdin would go, herd. And I go, herd of what? Herd of elephants. <laughs> Of course, I've heard of elephants. There's a flock of them. <laughs> <laughs> Which I didn't write. I, I wish I had written that joke. I, st I stole that from somewhere. So and, I, can't, I can't remember why. Oh, I do apologise, sir. That's the very violent lady at the back. So, if we could now. Well, I've got it. Ah, while not, well, while, while you're there. Um, John, the last time you did uh, Sleeping Beauty with Chris, the story was over by the interval, and the second half was full of the good old fashioned panto gag routines. Is the next one going to be the same? Well, um, I haven't gone as far as Act 2 yet. Um, I, I'm, I'm on Act 1 at the moment. But you're right. Yeah, another, I'm trying to think. It's a strange one. Um, uh, I think what Bath does, or what we try to do, is a really good traditional story-led family pantomime. And Chris was always adamant that it's all about the story. The story is the most important thing, and I, and I, and I, I agree with that, and I try to pursue that 
ambition. I think sometimes if you go to see uh, the, the bigger, more commercial pantomimes in some of the bigger venues where they get the big stars, it can be a bit more of a, of a variety show where it's, it's effectively a vehicle for the, for the big name and the plot can sometimes get, get pushed into the background, uh, which I think is a shame. So I, I'm, I'm of the opinion if it doesn't serve the story, it shouldn't be in there. There's got to be a reason for it, why, why these things happen in these routines and these uh, songs and dances. I mean, I, I, I'm aware that um, I think Brian Connolly did Cinderella in Bristol Hippodrome a few years ago and he was playing Buttons and he's rejected by Cinderella. And, so, and Cinderella says to him, are you going to be all right, Buttons? And he went, yeah, I'll be fine. I'm doing 9 to 5 next in the West End. And they went into a big routine of 9 to 5, a full song and dance number. And it was basically an advert for his next show. Yeah. And that's got nothing to do with the story of, of yeah, Cinderella. Yeah. So, I, I, you know, that's, so, so we don't do that. So, um, but, yes, yeah, some fairy tales are a little bit uh, imbalanced between where all the action happens, certainly in Jack and the Beanstalk. But, yeah, but Act 2 is basically just a, a, an elongated chase sequence because it's all, everything's been done by the interval. So, um, uh, yeah, I will, I, will, I will try to avoid that. But I, but I do like to make sure there are a, a couple of traditional old routines in there or, or one that we haven't done before. I think, I don't think, I don't think we're going to do the bench this year. <laughs> uh, no, sorry, I, I, I misspoke. I, I think we're going to oh, do the bench no, this year. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, it's, not, it's not in there at the moment. Um, it's not in there, but the, the producer likes it. He's like, ah, oh, it's, like, it's like turkey at Christmas. You can't, you can't not have the bench. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm so, I can't think of another way of doing the bench. I'm out of ideas. So maybe, uh, we'll see what comes to me. This is the ghost in the background walking yeah, up. Yeah, the bench yeah, yeah. gag, which is a hugely traditional gag. Yes. And, um, and I'm aware that people love it. And, and it um, <laughs> but I, yeah, I've, I've done it a lot. I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to think of another way I can... In, I can Long may it continue. Yeah. So that feels like the right length of the questions, unless anyone else is champing at the bit for a final question. Um, this has been a fantastic experiment. Thank you so much. The Good Listening To show and podcast is out there wherever you get your podcast. There are about 140 episodes out there using the same structure. Your feedback this evening would be really, really appreciated. I'd like to sincerely thank the Egg Theatre. Kate Cross, the wonderful curator of the Egg, was my first guest today. I've done two uh, shows for taking a punt on this idea. And it's been a lovely journey where there are actually three people in the audience for the first show. Now it feels like a minibus has arrived. <laughs> then there'll be a coach. And then in a few years' time, we'll be in the Wembley Arena with Michael Palin, probably. But um, <laughs> thank you so much. There are some forms down here for you to please fill in and give us... Uh, feedback is always a gift. I'd love to know what you thought was good, bad, crap or indifferent about what you just observed. But thank you so much for investing in something when you had no idea what to expect, which I'm very, very grateful for. John and I are both in Instant Wit, uh, in Instant Wit, rather, a Bristol-based comedy improvisation company, so you can definitely see us on stage together a lot more. But long may your reign in pantomime continue. Ladies and gentlemen, my wonderful, gorgeous, charming guest, Mr John Monique. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your questions. Thank you very much indeed if you've been watching on the Hinterweb 2, and good night. Please fill out, there's a free pen if you fill out the form. Thank you very much. You've been listening to the Good Listening To show here on UK Health Radio with me, Chris Grimes. Oh, it's my son. If you've enjoyed the show, then please do tune in next week to listen to more stories from The Clearing. If you'd like to connect with me on LinkedIn, then please do so. There's also a dedicated Facebook group for the show too. You can contact me about the programme, or if you'd be interested in experiencing some personal impact coaching with me, care of my Level Up Your Impact programme, that's chris at secondcurve.uk. On Twitter and Instagram, it's... At that Chris Grimes. So until next time, from me, Chris Grimes, from UK Health Radio, and from Stan... To your good health. And goodbye.